The more I study this stuff, the more I realize how close we are to a one world government. And it is going to be a shock for most people when it happens. But it is going to happen. It's on its way. It's just a matter of time. Father, add your blessing, study of your word now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, this morning, <clears throat> we're going to continue with what we left off with last week. I'm not going to spend any more time talking about buildings and about occult uh, signatures, signs, symbols, and so forth in Washington, D.C. It's full of them. We could spend the next month uh, talking about that and, and what's the purpose. Uh, ask yourself this question. Why is it that there is a 600-acre plot in the original uh, design of Washington, D.C. by a Frenchman, a 600-acre plot starting with the number 600, and the Capitol building is sitting on a acre that is numbered 666. That is no coincidence. Amen. Why is it that the Washington Monument, which is an obelisk, and if you went home and looked up what that obelisk means, you will probably blush if there's any, uh, any uh, meekness and morality left in this country. When you look at that, you'll probably blush when you realize what it represents and where it came from and what it's about. I can spin it any way they please. That's what that thing represents. It stands 555 feet above ground, and the only way to prove how far it goes beneath ground is to dig it up or take what uh, records that we have that says that it goes 111 feet beneath the surface of the ground, which would give it a total height from base, from the bottom to the top, of 666 feet. Now think for yourself. If you have a, a, a structure that's 555 feet high... That's one structure sitting like that. Don't you think you're going to have to bury that thing in the ground for it to stand? You bet. It's not 10 or 20 feet. No way, Jose. That thing is in the ground, or it would be falling over. And 111 feet doesn't seem to me to be at all out of the question. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's 666 twice. And then there's the, uh, uh, the matter of the structure of the roads and those three circles that I showed you last week on that map that have six major points that come into each one of them, giving you another 666, and it's all over the town. What's the bottom line? The bottom line is that the, the uh, city of Washington, D.C. Was, uh, was constructed by, by design by as high, a, a high an echelon of Masons and Illuminati as you can find. That's the bottom line. And that there, was a, uh, that there is a purpose in the construction of the capital of this country because there was a purpose in this country. And there was a design in the establishment of the United States of America and what they intended to do. As I said about Francis Bacon when he was talking about uh, North America and what they planned to do. Now I'm going to spend just a little bit of time with the, uh, with the Masonic Lodge. And then I'm going to move on into the Lucis Trust and the Luciferian Initiation. And just exactly what's involved when you get into the high levels of uh, selling your soul to the devil. Because you are given safeguards and you have to cross those barriers in order to do that. But they do. They cross it. And, it, uh, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. We're also going to talk about the Bilderbergers. The meeting they just recently had. And they posted the people who attended that meeting online. I got online this morning tried to find the names. And the names have either been obscured some way or removed. I don't know. But I have a list of the people who, who, uh, who attended the Bilderberg meeting. Now, make no mistake about it. The Bilderbergs, according to David Rockefeller and others, is clearly designed to bring about a one world government. As I said before, Satan never puts all of his eggs in one basket. Never, never, never. He's too clever for that. And what he does is create this great superstructure of intertwining uh, network, uh, networking uh, 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 organizations to bring about a one world government. And he intends to do it, and he's, he's going to do it, and he's right now uh, very close to doing it. And one more time, I'll give you this, you know, say this as it relates to the Masons. Uh, many of the people in the Masonic Lodge are good people. They love the Lord. They're good Christian people. 
And uh, there's no question about that. And you, and you know, and I have known and know many that are in the Masonic Lodge. This is not a, an expose of the Masonic Lodge in its lower echelons. We're talking about those who rise to the highest degrees. 33rd degree, when they get up into the highest echelons of this, there's something that takes place. And we're going to look at that. And I want you to, uh, I want you to keep that in mind. We mentioned a few days ago about serpent worship. Do the, is, there, is serpent worship active today? Yes, it is. Especially when you begin to hear how they define what we're talking about. You see, definition is very important. Albert Pike, who was probably one of the most uh, brilliant of all of their, of their uh, scholars, wrote The Morals and Dogma, which has become a, essentially the handbook of the Masonic Lodge. And if you've ever seen a copy of the Morals and Dogma, you know what I'm talking about. It's in print. It's, there's nothing here that, uh, that, uh, you know, that we're trying to uh, deface anyone with. It's in print. So the Morals and Dogma literally lay out the, the groundwork for the Masonic Lodge's religion. And it is a religion. It is a religion. Albert Pike, his monumental work, Morals and Dogma, speaks greatly about the importance of the worship of the serpent in the various pagan mystery religions of antiquity. As you read his description of the importance of the serpent worship, please bear in mind... Let me get this off of here. Please bear uh, in mind that Pike has dogmatically stated, Masonry is identical to the ancient mysteries, which means that all their teachings, all their books, are precisely the same as the ancient pagan satanic mysteries. Pike, a 33rd degree Mason... The serpent entwined around the egg was a symbol common to the Indians, the Egyptians, and the Druids, and the Druids they hold in high esteem. It referred to the creation of the universe, so therefore the serpent is directly connected with the creation of the universe. Our mode of teaching the principles of our profession, masonry, is derived from the Druids, and our chief emblems originally came from Egypt. This is by George Oliver Bell Publishing, 1775, page 195. Albert Churchward, another Masonic writer, states that Masons are our present Druids. And this is from Albert Churchworth, Signs and Symbols of Primordial Man, the Evolution of the Religious Doctrine from the Eschatology of the Ancient Egyptians, 1913, page 189. Another Masonic author, George Oliver, notes also noted Freemasonry connection with the Druids. The Druids had a high veneration for the serpent. Their great God, who was typified by that reptile, is represented by the bards as the wonderful chief dragon, the sovereign of heaven. And this is from his work, Signs and Symbols, uh, published by Masonic Supply Company, 1906. These publications are going back to the uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th century. When Masonic authors Pike Hutchinson, Churchward, and Oliver identify Masonry as coming from the Druid religion, this, is, this, is, this admission is extremely damning. Masons admire the Druids, and some of them even claim that Masonry came from Druidism. The Druids were occultic priests, practiced astrology, and offered human sacrifices. You should hear what uh, the Romans had to say about the Druids when they encountered them in, the, uh, in the, about uh, 150 A.D., 200 A.D. You ought to read what they had to say about the Druids, their priests and their women. Albert Pike reveals the other mystery religions throughout the globe at different times also worship the serpent in various ways, and on it goes. And I've got list after list after list, but for the sake of time, I want to move quickly through some of this stuff because there's no need in giving you 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 examples because I've got them. And there's no question that all of this stuff is documented. You remember I told you about the Ouroboros. How many of you remember what an Ouroboros is? Got a few hands go up. What is it? What's the Ouroboros? You remember the exactly the serpent eating its own tail. How many have ever seen anything like that? Keep your eyes open. You're going to see a lot of it. These symbols have power in them. They are power points. They are like chakras. Hey, we talked about Kundalini Yoga. They're a place where you can connect with a power higher than yourself. And of course, I'm not telling you that I believe this in the sense that you go out and do it. I'm telling you this is what they believe. And I'm telling you that the world of the occult and the world of the dark and the world of Satan is a world of power. There's real power in it. Make no mistake about that. 
There's probably more power in a witchcraft coven that meets on, on uh, All Hallows' Eve right before Halloween uh, than there is in the average Christian church. You know why? They believe what they're doing. And they've sold their soul to Satan. And he has given them the kingdoms of this world and the power associated with it. The average Christian, the only thing he's got on his mind is what he's going to watch on TV that afternoon or where, it's, where he's going to eat or what have you. Am I right? I am. But anyway, it uh, connected with ev- practically every culture on the face of this earth, somehow or another, in one form or another, worships the, worships the, uh, the serpent. Now listen to this. The serpent is the symbol and prototype of the universal Savior, who redeems the worlds by giving creation the knowledge of itself and the realization of good and evil. Manly P. Hall, 33rd degree Mason, the secret teachings of all ages. Now what have they done? They've equated the serpent with the Lord Jesus Christ, given him the power of creation. Now, I told you that in the book of Genesis, when that conflict took place when, between the serpent, which was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and the first Adam, there would be a conflict or confrontation between that serpent and the last Adam. And there was. Because the, last, the first Adam, the confrontation took place, the first Adam fell. When the confrontation between that serpent and the last Adam took place, the last Adam stood. And that confrontation started in, in, in the wilderness when he, for 40 days, confronted him and offered him the kingdoms of the world. Why did he do that? Because he saw in him something that was different from all that came before him or since he came. So the worship of the serpent is, can be established, no question about it. And what you need to concern yourself with is do... Does the Masonic Lodge, when you rise to its highest echelons, not the lower end, they say themselves that for public consumption and for those initiates who enter in the lower end, they teach them one thing, but everything begins to change as they get higher. All of the stuff they were taught down here takes on a completely different meaning as they get higher in it and deeper in it. And that's what's important. Higher and deeper. This is why he warns them to... to to, uh, for those that have not known the depths of Satan. All right. So now, what, is that, what does that mean? What does it mean that, uh, that uh, the Masonic Lodge... I mean, how does that relate to us, preacher? It relates to you because the Masonic Lodge is, is in the highest echelons of government of the world. And that they are pulling the power strings and the power cords and calling the shots... And that uh, what's going on is not a is not so much a uh, quest for for uh, for for riches and fame. It's literally disciples of the devil who have sold themselves out to Satan for the power that comes in this temporal world, and they get that power. And power corrupts, you know the old axiom. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I don't know what it is about it, but it becomes addictive. That once they have power, they want more power. And once they have money, they want more money. And down through the, down through the, down through the years, the men who have had the most money, a lot of times don't spend that money. They just want more money. They love that money. John D. Rockefeller had a building full of people back in the early 1900s full of secretaries. A building full of secretaries. All they did all day long was count his money. That's how rich he was. He was rich beyond your wildest belief and understanding. So, how many of you have ever heard of the Lucis Trust or the Lucifer Trust? How many of you here this morning have any idea uh, what connection it might have with the United Nations? The United Nations is definitely, without question, a one world organization. They intend to destroy the sovereignty of every country on the face of this earth. And you can tell real quickly uh, how, how much of a patriot that your, pres- your current president or your current l- leaders in this nation are. You can tell real fast how much of a patriot they are by how much sovereignty they give up. The con- in other words, the control of our armies, the control of our finances and so forth to the U.N. You can tell real quickly, real fast. How much of a patriot they are. Now, the Lucis Trust was started by Alice Bailey. Alice Bailey Bailey had a visitation from a spirit channeler, guide, spirit being, whose name was Joal Cool. Now, I know this may sound like 
crazy, off-the-wall uh, stuff. And, and sometimes to a lot of people they think, well, what's that got to do with me? It's got a lot to do with you because the church today, right now, right now, most of the churches in this country are either in head over heels into Alice Bailey's teachings or they're headed that way. I'm talking about the grandmother in the United States of the occult world that's being as it's known and understood today. This is, this is the lady, Alice Bailey. She is a disciple of Helen Blavatsky, who was a Russian back in the 1800s. And Adolf Hitler, when he began to formulate his Mein Kampf and his religion and his faith and his belief, borrowed heavily from Alice Bailey and from the occult world. And he also had some personal occult teachers that taught him firsthand. He took all that stuff and he repackaged it and made it into German mysticism because he elevated the German people above all the rest of the people of the world. So Alice Bailey is very important. She's very important to, all, uh, to everybody today. And she is so important that the organization that she started... Uh, Lucis Trust is recognized by the United Nations. Now get this, she starts a, an occult religious organization and it is, re and is recognized by the United Nations as a legitimate NGO, non-governmental organization. And they have a direct voice in the decisions that are made and the policies that are made in the UN as it relates to religion in this country. In Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, all over the world. It's mind-boggling to believe that one woman who started an organization in this country could have that kind of influence, and yet she does. The Lucis Trust has been part of the UN for 50 years at the United Nations Plaza. It is currently located on Wall Street in New York City. It provides... Worldwide financial support for the Arcane School, which has turned out thousands and thousands and thousands of dedicated occultists. World Goodwill, an organization you're going to find out about in just a moment. You're going to be surprised at the people associated with it. Triangles, Lucis Publishing, Lucis Productions, Lucis Trust Libraries, and the new group of world servers. And it maintains the UN Meditation Room. How many of you remember that picture I showed you the other day of the U.N. meditation room? I left it up here on the pulpit. Do you remember that stained glass with that serpent wrapping itself around the serpent? So when you go into that meditation room to meditate on your God, however you perceive your God to be, your faith, what did, what did Gore call it? Your faith uh, tradition. tradition. When you go in there to meditate on that serpent in your faith tradition, as Mr. Gore called it, then you are standing before a serpent entwined about a uh, staff of some kind. And, of course, when you go to physician, I don't see many of them anymore that do this, mostly in the military, but they have the scabulus. And that's two serpents wrapped around a staff with a winged creature at the top. And then there's another one that has one serpent wrapped around it and uh, with, a, with a single staff, all right? The serpent, of course, is associated with healing, don't you notice? Have you noticed how that the serpent is associated with healing? The serpent is associated with creation? Notice how that this serpent that is in the wilderness, there in the garden, the serpent that, that confronted Adam, how that that serpent, for some reason or another, has been accepted into the world? In a good sense? Don't you think that's quite remarkable? That we have today people who could just literally uh, take the Bible and throw it out. Let me say something about the Bible now. The Holy Bible was written by the Jew. Uh, that's one race. That's one race. Okay. The Buddhists have their holy books. The Chinese have their holy books. The Japanese have their holy books. Uh, all over the, for example, the, the Muslim, he has his holy books. He has the Koran, then he has the, uh, the, uh, the one that Muhammad wrote himself, the, the commentary on the Koran. I can't think of the name of it right now. The Hadith. The Hadith. Yeah, the Hadith. They ha all of them have their holy books, okay? They've got their holy books. All right. And here's what they say to you. They, so what makes you think your holy book's better than my holy book? That's the idea. See? You, most of you are Western Europeans. All right. Western Europeans. Okay, here you are. You've got your holy book. It's your holy Bible. All right? The University of Tennessee would say to you, well, that's your holy Bible. 
But the Buddhist has his holy Bible. What makes your holy Bible better than his holy Bible? If you think that your holy Bible is better than his holy Bible, you are a bigoted, arrogant racist. You're full of hate. That's the idea. You think I'm kidding you? I just like to put it out the way it is. You have no right at all, according to them, to stand up and say, that's the word of God. No, that is a word from God. See? See the difference? If I say this is the word of God, that's vastly different than saying this is a word from God. And there we stand. There we stand. Now, how do you know this is the Word of God? All right, you say it's inspired. Something, what else? You've met the author? All right, now, here's, here's a simple, this is called logic in one sense, but it's also experiential because you either know you have believed or you haven't believed. But think about something for a moment. All of the stuff that I've been talking to you about, about the serpent, about, about, about how this, the, the occult world relates to the serpent, sees it and understands it. The Bible, if you've read the Bible, if you've prayed over the Bible, can you not see how that this book is vastly different from everything else on the face of the earth? And yet all the rest of that stuff out there, they may differ among themselves, but essentially about some things, you know. Minor points. But essentially, they're all saying the same thing. They may say it in a different way. So what does that say to you? That says to you that this has a fountain, a source, that is not theirs. And that their stuff is from a source and a fountain, not here. Because this book condemns what they say and what they believe. That's the difference. Now, if I, if I had Albert Pike up here this morning... He would tell you, he said, oh, the Bible's a wonderful book. The Bible's great truths. Why, the Bible tells us about God, you know, and the Christ and all of that. Why, why, it's wonderful. But now, also, we can find so many other great truths from other books, too. And what we need to do, since we are enlightened and we have this great intellect and this great initiation from God, is that we have this distinct ability to take the great truths of the Bible and the great truths of Buddhism and the great truths of Hinduism and the great truths of the Muslim and all of that, and we can put it all together and we've got our own religion. That's exactly what Albert Pike created in his Morals and Dogma. Exactly. That's exactly what he created and that's exactly where he is. Now follow along here. Now here's something else too. If this was just a matter of, and it's always been this way, of a group out here who are the witches and the wizards and, and Satanists and the occult and all of that, and there's always going to be this group and they've always been out there. If it's just a matter of that, you know, that's bad enough. But that's not what it's about. What I'm trying, what this lesson is about is the fact that it's not just out there. It's right smack in the church. It has become part of what's going on in the church house. And it has its, and it's already into the the, the, the the secular world. These builder burgers right here, these one worlders, the builder burgers. Let me read you some of the names. Now I'm not up here today to to uh, character defamation. I just want to read the list. This is the Bilderberg meeting attendees at Saint Moritz, Switzerland, nine through twelve June two thousand eleven. All right, now that's pretty current. I only listed the ones from uh, mark the ones from the United States. They say on their website, two-thirds come from the, from the European, from Europe, two-thirds come from Europe, and a third from the United States. All right. These are the Bilderbergs. They've got their own website. You can log on to it, Bilderberg.org. You know. Okay. Alexander, I mean Keith Alexander, Commander, National Security Agency. Uh, Roger Altman, Chairman, Evercore Partners. Jeff Bezos, founder and CEO, Amazon.com. See where they're working? Uh, Timothy Collins, CEO, Ripplewood Holdings. Martin Feldstein, George F. Baker Professor of Economics, Harvard University. Reed Hoffman, co-founder, executive chairman, Link, linked something, L-I-N-K-E-D-I-N, looks like. LinkedIn. Uh, Chris R. Hughes, 
co-founder, Facebook. <laughs> Do you have any idea when you put all of your information on Facebook and you get on there and spill your soul and broadcast to the world what all is going on in your personal private life? Who has that information? What they can do with that, and then what they can do once they've identified somebody on Facebook. Kenneth Jacobs, Chairman, CEO, Lazard. James Johnson, Vice Chairman, Perseus. Uh, Vernon Jordan, Jr., Senior Managing Director, Lazard Ferre Company. Uh, John Keane, General, U.S. Army, retired. Henry Kissinger, how many of you know who he is? Henry Kravis, co-chairman, co-CEO, Kohlberg, Kravis, Roberts & Company. Uh, Marie Jose Kravis, senior fellow, Hudson Institute. Uh, Ching Lee, senior fellow, director of research, John L. Thornton, China Center, Brookings Institute. Uh, Craig Mundy, chief research and strategy officer, Microsoft Corporation. Peter Ortsog, vice chairman, Citigroup Global Markets. Peter Pearl, Richard Pearl, rather, uh, resident fellow, American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. Public Policy Research. Whoa, would that have any bearing on you? You suppose that have anything to do with the way they, they hand cases down through courts anymore? Do you have any idea how they do the court system today? Uh, Richard Pearl, president, so forth. Uh, David Rockefeller, former chairman, Chase Manhattan Bank. If you'd like to be enlightened... Just type the name David Rockefeller into your computer and just put David Rockefeller quotes. It'll blow your mind at how open he is to a one world government. To get paraphrase him, he said, to paraphrase him, here's what Rockefeller said. We no more need a country run by a bunch of illiterate uh, uh, nothings then uh, we need a country that is run by the elite who know exactly what's going on and how that they can make decisions that are best for the country. In plainer words, democracy and republic and all of that out the door. That's the attitude of the New World Order. That's exactly what it's going to be like. It, you talk about Hitler and authoritarianism and a dictator like Stalin. Well, that's Sunday school compared to what the New World Order is going to be. And so it goes. Robert Rubin, co-chairman, Foreign Council on Foreign Relations, executive chairman, uh, Smith, Eric Smith, executive chairman, Google Incorporated. I've been using your stuff, son. <laughs> James Steinberg, De deputy secretary of state, Peter Thiel, president, Clarium Capital Management, Christine Varney, assistant attorney general for antitrust. Uh, James Vopel, founding director, Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research. Demographic Research. You know what that is? That's a big word. You know what that word means? Graphis in Greek means to write, okay? So it's a writing. It's a map. A graphic is a map, a picture of something. Demographic has to do with the people that live in a certain area. See? That's a demographic. That's, that's what it's talking about. So they research the people that live in a certain area. Former Governor, Federal Reserve Board, Kevin Warsh. Boy, what am I telling you? I'm telling you that the Bilderbergers, which is a one-world organization, is pushing for a one-world government, and that they are not going to stop until there is a one-world government. And they have, they have, they have, uh, they have managed to get uh, much further along the line than people can give them credit. Right now, things are happening right now that uh, just look and just watch and observe in the next few weeks and months. You're going to see some things begin to change. I want to move quickly through some more of this stuff. I've only got 15 minutes left, and I want to cover the Luciferic initiation. All right. This will blow your mind. All right. World Goodwill is a non-government organization. World Goodwill is accredited with the United Nations. World Goodwill is an arm of Lucis Trust. It is Lucifer Publishing. It is literally Alice Bailey who's gone on to her reward, but it is her influence in this world today. 
look, and they make no bones about it. They talk about the full moon. They talk about the power that uh, that you can that that's that's uh, uh, that's present in all of these different stuff and this and so forth. And now here's what they say: In considering the above information, one can't help but wonder whether these organizations, which are aligned with Lucifer's trust, believe in the plan as World Goodwill put it. And here's the plan: to initiate action to prepare for the new world order. I believe that they do, and it is my intention to prove that conviction throughout this site. And I'm quoting Terry Mellinson from Conspiracy Archive. You'd like to look this up for yourself. And here's what he gets into. Here's what her mystery guide said to her, Alice Bailey. When the Great One appears, Master Dwal Cool said through Alice Bailey, he will take the mysteries religion preserved by Freemasonry and make them public. Lucis Trust has truly become a powerhouse of the New Age deal, ideal, the transformation of society by and through occult initiatory means. The respect that Bailey's teachings receive and the reverence for her master is without equal. Once the key to Genesis is in our hands, it is the scientific and symbolic Kabbalah which unveils the secret the great serpent of the Garden of Eden, according to her, and the Lord God are identical. Now they're, getting, they're preparing the world for the greatest deception it's ever had. How do you do it? You prepare a whole generation dumbed down in the scriptures. And then you present their God to them. The, guard, the great serpent of the Garden of Eden and the Lord God are identical. Stand in awe of him, and sin not. Speak his name with trembling. It is Satan who is the God of our planet, and the only God. And on she goes. When the church therefore curses Satan, it curses the cosmic reflection of God. In this case, it is but natural to view Satan, the serpent of Genesis, as the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind. For it is he who was the harbinger of light, bring radiant Lucifer... Who opened the eyes of automaton, Adam, created by Jehovah as alleged, and he was first to whisper, In the day ye eat thereof ye shall be as Elohim, God, knowing good and evil. Can only be regarded in the light of a Savior, an adversary to Jehovah. He still remains in esoteric truth, the ever-loving messenger, who conferred on us spiritual instead of physical immortality. Man, Satan or Lucifer represents the active centrifugal energy of the universe in a cosmic sense fitly is he and his adherents consigned to the sea of fire because it is the sun the fount of life in our system where they are petrified and churned up to rearrange them for another life that sun which as the origin of the active principle of our earth is at once the home and the source of mundane Satan in other words they look forward to the lake of fire because there the transformation takes place See how they take the Bible, twist it, make it mean something that it doesn't mean? All right. Now, we've established Alice Bailey as an occultist. We've established her organization without question as an occult organization. We've connected that with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the, with the highest echelons of the Masonic Lodge because that uh, spirit guide said when these uh, secrets are revealed, it will be the revelation of the highest the deepest secrets of the Masonic Lodge. Now I want to talk to you about Luciferic initiation because this is what people that are practicing Kundalini Yoga are headed for. They're getting all of this stuff, but they don't realize what they're getting. What is a Luciferic initiation? Let's read it. Listen carefully. You probably won't hear me say anything before or after that is more profound as what I'm about to read to you. Some background is necessary on chakras and Kundalini. In, and this is from another researcher. This is from Mendelssohn. In order to proceed further with this expose, in Hindu occult practice, the main root of the New Age movement, there are seven major centers for kundalini energy. By occult methods using meditation, drugs, visualization, yoga, and whatever means necessary, initiates seeking to awake the sleeping fiery serpent for a higher state of consciousness. This kundalini energy is visualized as an entwined serpent which rises from the base of the spine to enlighten 
and eventually dissolve the ego to become a God incarnate, thereby preventing further incarnation on the physical plane. The New Age disciples believe in reincarnation are taught by the demonic hierarchy that this is the only way to stop the endless cycle of karma to evolve into gods. This is the goal and that, the, that is, the goal and technique varies, but as one ascends through the seven progressive chakras, each is an initiation unto a higher consciousness, until finally when you reach the point of union with Sanat Kamura, Shiva, Vishnu, Lord of the World, or what they call the Christ Consciousness. Satan's deception is that through each successive chakra, the occult initiate actually does perceive a shift in consciousness, which to him it seems is a progressive shift. The occultist now feels his contact and psychic telepathy with the hierarchy getting stronger, as he continues, the initiate invariably reaches a point of no return. There is no turning back, and all those doubts he failed to heed, being the right path or not, are finally revealed to him, it's too late. There he is. This is called the Luciferic Initiation. Tex Mars Another author says, These feelings voiced by so many who have received a Luciferic initiation are significant. They point to two inescapable facts. Number one, the initiate recognizes that he is coming into close contact with dark, evil forces and a spirit of fear engulfs him. Number two, after the initiation, his mind is patently altered. This is what New Agers call Kundalini, or the Shaki, Shaki Tipat experience, technically termed a paradigm shift. Paradigm simply means a complete change, shift. So what's happened? They have crossed a line that they cannot go back across. Why is that important? When Rick Warren has three doctors that start the Daniel plan in January that has to do with holistic healing and the health of the body, and one of those doctors on his website talks about Kundalini Yoga, and you've got a church, you've got a, a building with a cross on it out here in, in Clinton, Tennessee, that is that is uh, that is offering yoga right now in their in their church. Yoga, the word yoga as as defined by Hindu means a yoke. So they're bringing themselves into a world that they think, you know, you know how the average American is. It's cafeteria religion. It really is. You go through the line, I like this, I want this, I want this, I want this. When you get to the end, you've created your own religion. That's the average American. They have no idea of the dark, evil forces and power that they're messing with. Now somebody said, well, no, wait a minute. You can't commit a sin that you can't be forgiven for. Have you ever considered the unpardonable sin? There is neither forgiveness in this world nor in the world to come. And that is a sin that I do believe that is consciously made by an individual. When you cross a line that you can't go back across. I want to quickly get this for you. We've got about five minutes. This Luciferic initiation. You say, well, you don't really believe the people in a church are going to do that, do you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Once the interest is, is sparked, is, is, uh, once the person is, 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 is they've taken on a new thing, a new world here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Some, not all of them, but some of them will. Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. What about the preacher? What about the man that's pushing this stuff? What about the man who started this stuff? Did you know he says that he's a member of the CFR, which makes him a member of the UN? But anyway, there's a lot of definitions of terms, and we don't get into all of that. But I want to get into this color spectrum, because this is important. And uh, I, I knew it would be hard to cover all this material, all this volumes of stuff I've got piled up. But listen to this. Lucifer is the ruler of humanity, and when you, according to them. And when you get into this, you get into these Christ, you get into this consciousness, these seven chakras. Each chakra is associated, associated with a color. I wish you could see this, but here's one right here that this fellow's research and put. The top one is a kind of a, uh, uh, it, looks, it looks to me like a kind of a purple color. But there's a chakra, the fifth one, is associated with the throat, and its color is blue. Blue. It's quite an amazing thing. And it is at this point 
The fifth chakra, according to what these people say, that is the most critical point. That you can begin to delve into this, but there's always, there's, for a while, there's a time you can back out. But you get to a certain point, and you cross that point, there's no backing out. You're in it. And it is at this fifth chakra, listen to this. According to the Hindu tradition, each chakra center also has its associated color. If you look at the drawing at top right, you see the fifth chakra, Lucifer, is given the color blue. Because it is representation of throat chakra bathed in, the, bathed in its characteristic blue light. Look familiar? It should. The Reader's Digest full page ad I've shown above also has a blue glow. In part one, I displayed the Lucis Trust logo and it too features this streaming blue light. The New Age symbol invented by Foster Bailey has a plethora of symbolic imag- imagery. The symbol, according to Lucius Trust, set in a limitless field of blue, which signifies the sphere of life expression of our solar logos, blah, 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 a bunch of New Age mumbo jumbo. But each successive ascendancy through these chakras is associated with a certain color. In plain words, if a man has reached the point of blue and begins to manifest blue, and I love blue, that's my favorite color, <laughs> but he manifests blue in his symbols and in his, and his, and his uh, advertisements and so forth, he's making a statement to those in this stuff. They know by the color that you show how far you've advanced, just like that. They know how far you've advanced in initiation. If you show purple, you're at the top. That's as high as you go. And he mentions this about the Masonic Lodge. He says, Blue is the Masonic Blue Lodge for blue light eyes of Horus, the Watcher. The United Nations has blue flags and helmets. Blue is for the occultic blue lips of death. So forth and so on. You'll never look at colors again the same. All right. I've got about two minutes and I want to read this great invocation for you. This is a mantra for the New Age and for all humanity. This is United Nations passing this thing about the world religions, saying that we need to get the world religions together. If you'll remember just a few Sundays ago, pastors in this country got up in their pulpits and they read from the Koran. Some of them even had Muslim imams come in and speak to their congregation. There's a big push afoot right now to bring the religions together. You've been brainwashed just like every other American, unless you have enough of the grace of God and light to know the difference, somewhere along the line, they made you, they started preaching to you about hate speech. That's garbage, okay? That's pure bunk. That is an assault on freedom of speech. Okay. Hate speech, hate crimes. Okay? That's, that, that is the most un-American thing you ever heard in your life. That's garbage. But anyway... They're going to use that against Christian preachers who preach the truth, that Christ is the only way. I'm a hate preacher. Here we go with a great invocation, a mantra for the new age and for all humanity. They designed it so that Christians, Buddhists, Muslims, and everybody could pray the same prayer and come together. This is a universal prayer. Here we go. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. You say, well, that doesn't sound like too bad a prayer. If you've studied anything, if you've been listening to anything I've said in here about the occult world and their definition of terms, you would know when they say, may Christ return, that has no reference whatsoever to the Lord Jesus Christ. That has no reference at all to Him. None. None. Mantra means, or invocation means, the great invocation, it means to conjure up. That's what the term invocation means. A mantra for the new age and for all humanity. The word mantra is, is, uh, is uh, associated with the word mantra. 
which has to do with a repetitious, uh, a repetitious anything said during a time of meditation, usually in a yoga position. All right. So what they've done is they put plenty of new age in there. They put enough in there for everybody where they could all feel like that they're part of this new world religion. And they're pushing it everywhere in America with buildings that have crosses on top of them. And the reason it's not in this church is because this book is preached and the Holy Ghost is in here. He's in here. And the Holy Spirit would throw a red flag up in your face so fast it'd make your head swim if a New Ager came in here and started babbling that New Age garbage. Immediately. They could get up and say they love Jesus all they want to. If their talk is full of New Age terminology and New Age words, they don't love the Jesus that I know. That's the problem. That's the problem. And we're going to pick it up next week. We're going to pick it up. The word semantics. You know what the word semantics means? All right, here's blue and here's blue, okay? i got blue here and blue here. Blue to me may not be blue to you. What means blue to me may not mean blue to you. In other words, my definition of it is not the same as your definition of it. That's semantics. It's a nuance in expression and understanding of terms. And that's what you got to deal with. you got to deal with people who come into your midst and start using the same terms you use, but they don't believe what you believe. They're not talking about the same thing you're talking about. you got to watch for that. That's one of the most... Dis- that's one of the deepest, greatest forms of deception there is, is the definition of terms. Yeah.